Whose world is this? Whose world is this? Whose world is this? My name is Diane Keelan Sukra, and um, I first, I'm first i a resident of Mission for the past seven years, along with my family, my husband, and children. And I'd like to say, first of all, the way that, um, you know, Mary Tempe, the way you've portrayed the, the, the question tonight for council is almost as though the assumption is that council's job tonight is to just pass this along and then the public will, will decide upon it. But I, I think that that perception is probably coming from the fact that this entire discussion has been framed by P3 Canada, Partnerships BC, and Delois and Touche, which is actually uh, you know, a limited viability corporation that provides, that is a sponsor of P3 Canada and uh, is involved in all of these P3 projects and beneficiary of it all across this nation. And um, so I, I would like the opportunity to reframe this vote because what this council, I think, may be setting itself up for, and it's because of the, the council you've received, is for a situation where the public will be against you. Because I can tell you, everybody I know, all of my friends, all of my neighbors, everybody is greatly concerned with what's being proposed here tonight. And there isn't a person, even a natural human being, who can warm to the idea of a private corporation having anything to do with our water. That play that are continue to, to you know political pressures at play that are um, that are again framing the discussion for this council and one of which is this ad which just astounded me by the mayor of Abbotsford um, George Perry where he's clearly speaking on behalf of you I don't know if you uh, were authorized this ad or were part of paying for it. Uh, but certainly the Abbotsford taxpayers were and in here you know he goes on about about misleading and whatnot in the in the press but. He, you know, I'll quote from this ad on April 1st. At no time has or will the District of Mission or the City of Abbotsford consider a proposal to privatize our water. Okay, fine, but we cannot make a rational or well-informed decision, neither can council, neither can the public, unless we agree on the fundamentals of what we're actually talking about here. And what we're talking about is, despite what Delois is saying, and what P3 Canada is saying, is what we're discussing here is the privatization of our water services. And once these corporations get a foothold into our municipality, they will continue to, they, they will lobby you from this day until, you know, if you're still in council. Um, <laughs> water services. They're not going to come into any municipality anywhere, not even in the developing world, and say, hi, we want to own your water. No, they're only interested in running the profitable elements of it. And that's So this is called privatization, and privatization, even among those who support it, will admit that it does involve a loss of accountability, a loss of transparency, and control. It's only a question of degrees and how important it is, like the brother was saying about, you know, is it a storage warehouse, a, the building of the city council, or is it water? And when it's water, you cannot afford to compromise on these things. Neither really when it comes to utilities. We can see that unfolding right before our eyes in Japan today, and it is absolutely tragic. It's widely being reported that the private corporation that uh, is running Tokyo Electric Power made several critical cost-saving, profit-making decisions for themselves all along the way. Things like disregarding 3,000 years of, of, you know, of geological history, the kind of things that would present to you, you overworked council and say, oh, well, we've authorized some several studies and business case analysis and it's all looking good to me. They use their own computer programs rather than international, um, internationally accepted computer programs to um, to do tsunami protection and to assess risk. And these were decisions that were very good for their corporation. They increased their profit. But look at the ultimate cost. The ultimate cost was paid for in lives. And it's being paid for with lasting social, economic, and environmental devastation. And what is ending up happening here is that it's not the corporation that's going to ultimately pay the price for this. It's the people. Right now, there's a movement in, in Japan. Not a, this is being there's federal affair, there's uh, government officials who are demanding the nationalization of of TEPCO, the, the the Electric Power Corporation, 
because they don't have the capacity to handle the crisis which they've created. And along with that bankruptcy, which is, what, which is a real possibility for all water corporations as well, is that they just walk away. That's why they incorporate. It's called limited liability. Exactly right. So I don't know about cost savings, but you know, they're, they're, in the end, we're going to be the ones having to pay, pay for it. And in fact, I was reminded of this when I read this report by, um, by Delois and Touche, uh, Mark, um, that on page 23 you'll find there's a limitations and disclaimer. If you could take a look at it, that would be great. Because it says that this beautiful report presented today to us, upon which you're supposed to make your decision as to whether or not to move forward with the privatization of our water services. This report, quote, relies on certain information provided by third parties, none of which Delois has independently reviewed. No to rely in any manner or for any purpose on this report. The law services may include some advice or recommendations, like by the way, go for the P3, but all decisions in connection with the implementation of such advice and recommendations shall be the responsibility of and made by the AMWSC, our, our Water and Sewage Commission. We're ultimately responsible. Everything they've said in here, they are not responsible for. And when you end up in a P3 deal with, with, uh, with the inevitable multinational water corporation that will come in, uh, you will find the deal will be over a thousand pages. It will be filled with disclaimers and limitations just like that. Things you never could have foreseen, things that our poor staff here could have never even imagined. And when, it talk, when you talk about communications, we talk about lawyers, when you talk about you know, uh, um, corporate boards, they outnumber and outpower us and will outwit us at absolutely every single right. turn. Right. So I think we should just throw out this idea of risk transfer because there isn't a single um, thing I can imagine is more risky than, than playing with our water in this fashion. And remember, I really believe that the intentions from which anybody goes into any project, when you go into politics, you, go, you have a family, when you go to work, your intentions are more important than anything. And in this case, your intentions as council are good. They're, your intentions are to, to, to protect our water supply, to give good, clean, accessible water to all. And it's the intention of the water workers in this city to do the exact same. However, the intention behind these corporations is not that it is for profit, and they have worldwide um, uh, plans. They, the, the, the World Water Council is made up of the three major water uh, multinationals, uh, both of which are in the city of Moncton, and recently uh, with the Council of Delois in the city of Winnipeg. Um, and that's uh, Thames Water, Veolia, Veolia Environment, and Suez. And so they're there to make money, and like the other brother said, the why are they there? It's because money is, is bigger money, because water is bigger bucks right now than, than gold. It's, it's worth more than oil, and will increasingly be so. But unfortunately, water equals life. And if they control water, they control our life. Right on. Another one of the brothers mentioned Hamilton, and I just wanted to read a quote from a report that came out last year in 2010, uh, written by the Council of Canadians and the Canadian Union of Public Employees. And in that report, it's called Public Water for Sale, How Canada Will Privatize Our Water Systems. On page 17, they describe this horrific ordeal um, that they went through. They said, the work, quote, the workforce was immediately cut in half. Millions of liters of raw sewage spilled into the Hamilton Harbor. Homes were flooded and major additional costs were incurred. Numerous charges over years were laid by the Ontario Ministry of the Environment against the contractor for not meeting effluent standards. The private water contract changed corporate hands four times. In 2004, City Council ended its experiment with privatization and brought operation of its water and wastewater systems back in-house. And you know what? Their experience is not unique at all. Um, even in the, the Q&A uh, sheet that the council was provided with at the March 17th meeting, 
Um, somebody did ask the question about where else in Canada has this been tried. Well, this is this is what you know. Canada is this new market. Somebody else also mentioned the um, the CETA agreement, the Comprehensive Economic Trade Agreement. The only reason why it's called comprehensive is because this new agreement that's being negotiated by our federal government is going to comprehensively include the one thing that nobody, no politician, no government would have ever considered before in Canada, and that is access to our water rights. And um, uh, so, yeah, what I was going to say was that this, this um, uh, report doesn't also, the, the Q&A does not mention um, that the City of Moncton, which is run by Veolia Environment, um, they present it as a, as a wonderful example of how P3s can actually work in Canada, in our own, on our own home ground. But what is going on currently in, in France and in Europe is this massive backlash to corporations just like that. And I'm going to take a moment, there was a documentary that was written on, that was uh, just got released September of last year. And it tells the story, starting with the mayor of Munich um, and several councillors and mayor, the mayor of France, of Paris, and other municipalities, and as well as Veolia Environment executives talking about after 30 years of working with, with that corporation, what they saw was really behind this. And I'm going to play, I've converted it to an MP3, I'm going to play just a minute of it. It's really worth it, and I encourage anyone, it's called Water Makes Money, and if you go on YouTube under English, you'll, you'll be able to hear it, but I'm just going to play a short piece of it so you can hear from the mouths of other mayors and councillors who've had to go through this before. costing us more in the long run. Um, I also wanted to say that on their website, uh, this, this Veolia environment, which is currently now in the city of Moncton, as well as the city of Winnipeg, the only two cities, because the Canadian way is to keep water in, in public hands. And I would just, it would be the saddest thing ever to see our beautiful mission in Abbotsford succumb to this in the end. But, you know, th this, this corporation, um, that it also operates every single military base uh, that the United States has. And I don't know if that includes the, the one in the military dictatorship of Bahrain, but I don't know why we would want an outfit like that running our water. It's also interesting to note how much profit is available to be made to these companies and why they're motivated by it. On their 2010 website, they state that they made in consolidated revenue last year 50 billion US dollars. That's money that is being transferred from the public to private hands. And you wonder why our economies are all in a budget crisis. According to the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, Canada's entire um, water upgrade, infrastructure upgrade that would serve us for the next 100 years, the value of that is $30 billion. And they make more a year than what would, what would you know, provide water to our entire nation. So you can't help but wonder, you know, what is actually going on here? Who is pushing this P3 agenda in our community? <laughs> well, there's many people. Uh, 
of various political stripes who will tell you, and I want to start with a, a political insider and aide to both the Campbell Conservative, to the Campbell Liberal government, as well as the Harris Conservative government in Ontario. His name is Eric May, and he wrote an article last month, uh, which was published in Rabble, and where he warns Canadians of this rise of privatization in Canada, just from his inside perspective on the, the meetings of politicians with corporations, with corporate lobby groups, and the conclusions that he came to. And he explains that what is happening is there is a strategy afoot to starve the public sector of all function and form so that the favorite private enterprise and profit can swoop, can swoop in. And this is echoed by many others, including a professor at the University of Winnipeg, a Dr. John Loxley, where he argues that federal and provincial P3 initiatives have more to do with the promotion of an ideological agenda designed to commodify the state's activities and raise private sector profits from the provision of public sector services. And that's absolutely consistent with, what, with what's going on here. Municipalities are different though. Municipalities, you, you are the embodiment of local democracy. And it's, it, and I would, you know, I would urge you to resist the federal government's, you know, hostage holding. The thing that they do are, oh, we need money, we our tax dollars, we need to access our federal tax dollars in order to improve our water infrastructure. And they're telling us it's only on one condition, that you privatize your services that you subsidize the profits of the public, of the pri of private corporations, with our tax dollars. And you want to know what's even more shameful, this is the exact same strategy being used by the World Bank and the IMF all around the world to force nations and municipalities and regions to privatize their public services. I would like to recharacterize these two institutions, Partnerships BC and P3 Canada for you. They are basically taxpayer pay government agencies that exist to lobby you on behalf of private corporations. That happens to be the ideological wind of the day, but there's no reason why this council has to succumb to it. Again, I will urge you to, um, to demand an independent review of the work that's been done by Delois. Full and open comparison of the private versus the public project options. A comprehensive explanation should be provided to the, to the public on the dangerous pitfalls of privatization of water. And absolutely no serious presentation has been made on the benefits of the public option. I also... Yes, I'm just going to be wrapping up here, thank you. I also wanted to make the point, this council have made, has made some very progressive and forward-thinking decisions about food security and the importance of that to our struggling community. And we all know that we're look, we have, what we have to look forward to is rising food prices, rising transportation costs, an unstable world economy. We do not know what's happening with employment. And in the face of that, this council has adopted this food security policy. But that means nothing without water security. Because in the end, if we can't afford to shop in the grocery stores and we decide to grow our own food and become self-sustaining, how can we do that if we do not have full control over our water? So just to recap, knowing that all of this, what are we eyes wide open actually considering today? It is indeed the handing over of the finance and operation of our most vital resource for 25 years to the very corporations that Robin Hood's in reverse economics continue to prosper at all of our expense. We all have enough experience in our personal lives with the domination of corporations. Just think of your endless frustrations, you know. Here, have a $600 iPhone and then try, you know, and escape their three-year contract. And every time you want to make a change, they extend it again for another three years. And there's nobody to protest it. A guy showed up on uh, CBC Market Watch with a $15,000 cell phone bill because of roaming charges. And this is not unusual. Um, the bank scouts with hidden fees, credit card corporations, and as we can see, our governments on all levels are relatively impotent to deal you know, properly in the public interest once they're faced with such large and powerful forces. I don't see why we should invite these forces into our home. Here, here. Finally, I can tell you that as a mother, the issues of food and water security weigh especially heavily on the minds of parents who look around at this increasingly uncertain world and we ask ourselves, how would we respond? How would we protect our children in the case of a nuclear disaster in Japan or in a tsunami or in an earthquake 
or in the case of an economic meltdown or some kind of contamination to our water supply or a severe water shortage, an international one, which everybody is saying is coming our way, how are we going to protect them? Well, we can start by protecting our water supply. And for the sake of our children and the future of this community, I urge you to do the right thing today. Keep our water in public hands while you still have the ability to do so. Riding high, second world standing by, third world under fire, funny how we all conspire. We don't know cause we can't see how such a way could come to be. Riding on a spinning wheel, soon enough will be revealed. Whose world is this? Whose world is this? children be seen after all is said and done what kind of creed have we come to believe that they may never receive one said and done What kind of creed must we come to believe If they are ever to receive one